Who controls the past, controls the future. Who controls the present, controls the past. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Darren McBreen. It is Thursday, July 30th, 2015. Here's a quick look. What's coming up? Tonight, the pro-gun story you won't hear about. Crooks crash into a store and get fired upon by the shopkeeper's AR-15. Then... Go and take your seatbelt off. Stop! Stop! The aftermath of a traffic stop gone horribly wrong. And Dr. Paul Craig Roberts breaks down U.S. relations with Russia. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. NATO generals that look so soft and weak going, we're ready for war with the Russians. You don't talk like that even during the Cold War. You don't shoot your mouth off about nuclear war. The Russians aren't doing it. You understand? You understand, you soft, fake pieces of garbage? Protesters are expected to hit the streets of Cincinnati tonight as new graphic video was released of a deadly showdown between a cop and a civilian that ends in tragedy, leaving the suspect dead and a nation in outrage. You're looking at the body cam footage of police officer Ray Tensing. The footage was released yesterday and you can see and hear everything that happened during the incident. 43-year-old Samuel DeBose was pulled over for having his license plate displayed on the front dash window and not in front of his car. The driver then failed to give the officer his driver's license. And as you can see here, the situation quickly begins to escalate. Within moments, there is a brief struggle and then the suspect is shot almost point blank in the head. Now the police officer has stated from the very beginning that he was dragged by the car, the Honda Accord, and that he thought he was gonna get run over. He thought that his life was in danger. He feared for his life, so he pulled his weapon and he shot the driver. But if you look closely at the video, that isn't what happened. From the rev of the engine to the fatal gunshot to the head, less than three seconds go by. And keep in mind that this was just a routine traffic stop near the University of Cincinnati's campus. The officer wasn't dealing with someone who was wanted for murder. No, he was dealing with someone without a front license plate. In my opinion, a, a pretty ridiculous reason to get pulled over to begin with by a campus cop. He certainly didn't deserve to lose his life over it. Now, police officer Ray Tensing has been indicted for murder and charged with intentionally killing the man. If convicted, he could go to prison for life. Now, city officials were hesitant to release the body cam footage in fear that there might be major protests and riots to follow, but they did the right thing and they released the footage and also charged the cop with murder. And Joe Biggs is with us right now on the scene in Cincinnati. And, and Biggs, I think it was a good idea for city officials to release the video to the public and charge the cop with murder it's my guess that we might see some protests tonight, but not much rioting. What do you think? Yeah, it's good to see the city of Cincinnati really step up to the plate and kind of be an example for other instances like this that'll probably happen in the future. They got right to the point, you know, they looked at the footage without a doubt that is straight up murder. They indicted them. I mean, this happened in about 10 days, which is usually pretty unheard of with these uh, cop killing incidences where they've, you know, shot someone unarmed. So, but that being said, and the way that they basically brought swift justice, that's why you're going to see more protests instead of riots, I believe. Now, there's still a lot of people out here that are very upset at the fact that, you know, a man was murdered for not having a license plate on the front of his car. And earlier today, I had the opportunity to kind of go out to that site. It's at the, on Rice Street. Uh, it's about northeast of the university uh, campus, just right outside of the, uh, the outskirts there. And it's, it's a nice little quiet area. And, you know, there's a house right there. When I was there, the family said that they were there when it happened. You know, just 
to sit there and hear that, to hear a cop completely turn into a maniac and shoot someone in the head and murder them right there. That's I mean, right. And, and it was a, it was a campus cop. And I think it's ridiculous for campus cops to pull somebody over for not having their license plate on their, their front windshield or, or for, for not having it on, on front of the car. Cause he did have it placed on the front of his windshield. Hey, I want to talk about the Craigslist post that was put up yesterday in Cincinnati and apparently it called for all black people to shoot the cops and burn the police stations. And it even included graphic instructions on how to target the police. So no doubt there are some very angry folks out there. Then the cops might want to watch their backs. Have you heard of any threats to police since you've been there? Um, no, I came across this post yesterday and uh, sent it over to Mikhail Thalen, who put up the article on it. And I mean, that alone is alarming, but at the same time, you have to look at it. Now, is this an actual disturbed person who's very upset with what happened? The fact that, you know, Sam DeBose was murdered by a cop, or could this be a provocateur putting this up to further create tensions and possibly start a riot base off of that? So you never know with these things, but it's always good to, to keep that in the back of your head that something like that could possibly happen. I know that the law enforcement has been notified of this. Numerous other places have picked this up and are uh, are talking about that Craigslist ad. So it's definitely something that's in the back of everyone's mind. Yeah, I think it was just uh, trash talking, but obviously the cops do need to watch their backs. And what, what about this guy's rap sheet? I mean, Samuel DeBose, he'd been arrested like 60 plus times prior to the incident. Do you think the campus cop might have ran his name and, and maybe got a little nervous? I mean, that's always a possibility, but at the same time, you're supposed to be a peace officer, which that's means right. you, yep. you go in, you find out what's going on. If things, you know, tense up, then you de-escalate the situation and you start off with, hey, excuse me, sir, can you calm down? You know, can you do this or that? Uh, at no time was this police officer's life in jeopardy. You can see that clear in the video, the fact that he reached for his gun and shot him, you know, point blank right dead in the head. Is, is completely out of control. This should open up the eyes of a lot of people across America. There definitely needs to be some ch uh, changes in the way these police officers are trained. And I don't necessarily think that they should have their own campus cops with guns. This is something that the Cincinnati police should, I think, take over because they have more experience with this. Well, I, it, it, I was going to say, I absolutely agree with you. And it certainly is a tragedy. And now we know that that DeBose had just been recently engaged, and there was a very heartfelt interview yesterday, but he's got a nine-year-old son that was talking about how him and the family went out and bought a film projector. They were going to watch a movie, so they're going to have movie night, and, you know, obviously his father never made it home that night, so our hearts and prayers go out to the entire DeBose family. Joe Biggs, any last comments? What's on the schedule tonight? Are you going to go to protest? What do you got planned? Yeah, I'm going to be hanging around the University of Cincinnati later on. Uh, this is seems to be the forefront of where a lot of the protests have been. But I'm going to be quite honest with you, Darren. I got a rental car, and guess what? It does not have a license plate on the front. So I'm kind of sketched out. I'm wondering <laughs> every time a car goes by me or a cop, am I going to get pulled over and shot in the head because I don't have this, you know, license plate on the front of my car? That's right. You might get shot. So watch your back. Watch your back also tonight out there during those protests. All right. Thank you. All right. We're going to switch gears right now because I want to talk about an AR-15 success story where a clothing store owner in Wisconsin opened fire on a bunch of thugs who were trying to rob the place. And he successfully defended both his business and his life in the process. Rami Mirror, owner of a Milwaukee-based clothing store, posted video of the encounter to the company's Instagram account with a stark warning to any other potential burglars. Don't come to our establishment with guns or try breaking in our stores and expect less than us defending ourselves. We will protect our business and employees at any cost. And check this video out again. You can see in the video how the criminals used a car to smash into the, the doors so the robbers could get in, but they are quickly met with resistance. The owner managed to hit one of the guys as they ran the hell out of there. And they ran out of there in a big hurry. Nice job. So an AR-15 success story indeed.
But wait a minute. Don't tell me there's some of you out there that disagree with that. Oh, not you guys again. But I also believe that a lot of gun owners would agree that AK-47s belong in the hands of soldiers, not in the hands of criminals. If I could have gotten 51 votes in the Senate of the United States for an outright ban, picking up every one of them, Mr. and Mrs. America, turn them all in, I would have done it. Well, you see there, some people just don't get it. All I could say is, come and take it, Feinstein. Or, in the words of Clint Eastwood, Go ahead. Make my day. You know, with all this talk lately about gun control, it occurred to me that I have yet to see a single politician who can explain to me how they plan to take guns away from the criminal thugs who are out there on the streets right now. Oh, sure, you'll hear plenty of talk about how they plan to take guns away from us, us law-abiding citizens. But if you take guns away from all of us legal gun owners, then the only people that will have guns will be the bad guys. In fact, I'm curious. I want to see a show of hands right now. All those for gun control, raise your hand. All right, there's one, two, three, four. Anyone else? Ah, see there, that figures. All the usual suspects. Any questions? All right, we're going to take a quick break right now, but don't go anywhere because you don't want to miss this next segment. When we come back, we're going to take a look at the standoff between the United States and Russia right now in the Ukraine, a very dangerous and touchy situation that could escalate at any moment and turn into a global conflict. And it was Albert Einstein who said, I know not with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. I'll be talking with the father of Reaganomics, Paul Craig Roberts, about the likelihood of a nuclear exchange with Russia. Is it too late to avoid war? Well, you'll find out what Paul Craig Roberts thinks right after this. So stick around. As a community moves towards despotism, respect is restricted to fewer people. That's veteran Denver police officer Charles Jones IV smashing an unarmed suspect in the face six times. Officers accused of using excessive force on a suspect and then trying to erase the evidence. I'm, I'm observing what they're doing in there. Don't me. I don't understand what's going on. A community rates low on an information scale. When the press, radio, and other channels of communication are controlled by only a few people. Does it raise ethical questions about the use of government money to produce stories about the government that wind up being aired with no disclosure that they were produced by the government? How can you ask such a question? What difference at this point does it make? When a competent observer looks for signs of despotism in a community, he looks beyond fine words and noble phrases. There are actions I have the legal authority to take as president that will help make our immigration system more fair and more just. Tonight, I'm announcing those actions. What I say goes, see? I'm the law around here. <laughs> he came, he saw, he died. <laughs> Yes, in modern warfare, our military leaders are finding that words and ideas are highly effective weapons. We just have to be repetitive about this. We need to do this every day of the week and just really brainwash people into thinking about guns in a vastly different way. We are trained to deceive if we have to. You really don't have to trust me. You shouldn't trust me. In fact, by my actually participating in that, I will taint the news. In communities of this kind, despotism stands a good chance. The Nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Okay, Miss Youth, well, we're, we're going to do everything we can to help you. <laughs> Resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. It's the Alex Jones Show, because there is a war on for your mind.
Authoritarians merely want obedience, while totalitarians, whose rule is rooted in an ideology, want obedience and conversion. The authoritarians are the guys in charge who want to stay in charge, and they don't much care about you or what you're doing so long as you stay out of their way. Live or die, it's all same to the regime. Totalitarians are a different breed. These are the people who have a plan, who think they see the future more clearly than you, or who are convinced they grasp reality in a way that you do not. They don't serve themselves, they serve history or the people, or the idea, or some other ideological totem that justifies their actions. They want obedience, of course, but even more, they want their rule and their belief system to be accepted and self-sustaining. And the only way to achieve that is to create a new society of people who share those beliefs, even if it means bludgeoning every last citizen into enlightenment. That's what makes totalitarians different and more dangerous. They are totalistic in the sense they demand a complete reorientation of the individual to the state and its ideological ends. Every person who harbors a secret objection or even so much as a doubt is a danger to the future of the whole project. And so the regime compels its subjects not only to obey, but to believe. We celebrate the 4th of July as a reminder of earning our independence from a tyrannical and oppressive government. Just a reminder to the Obama administration, there's plenty of room on the calendar for another holiday. Jakari Jackson here, I'm going to talk to you guys today about civil asset forfeiture. And we'll start with this article from the Daily Caller. Civil asset forfeiture reform gains new steam in Oklahoma. And they describe it as the practice where law enforcement can seize property and keep it even if they don't convict or even charge someone with a crime. Then that person must go through the bureaucratic and often unsuccessful process to get their property back, whether it's a vehicle, cash, or a home. And there's a senator, Kyle Loveless, who introduced civil asset forfeiture reform bill this past May. And the reason why we want to address this is just like anything else, asset forfeiture is ripe for abuse. In one such case, a prosecutor had used the funds to pay off his student loans and was living rent-free in a home that had been forfeited. So we'd like to think that a forfeited home goes on to house foster children or maybe a seized vehicle goes to uh, take underprivileged children to school, but that's not always the case. And another thing, it's not big murderous kingpins who just have their property seized. It happens to normal people as well. We see the article, Stopping the Abuse of Civil Forfeiture. And in this article, they give the scenario of somebody who gets pulled over. Let's say you're going a few miles over the speed limit. You have about $8,000 in cash. The officers discover this for whatever reason. And now you have to make the choice. You can either give the money to the officer and risk not seeing it again, or you can be taken to jail for money laundering. And this isn't some fictional scenario. This actually happened to Roderick Daniels. And he's actually a success story because he got his funds back, but that was because local media attention and also legal pressure. A lot of people don't have either to come after these people. So you could have a scenario, let's say you get pulled over with 10 grand, you could spend five grand in the legal system, small claims or whatever the proper claim may be, trying to get your property back. It's your money, it's your property. You don't have to prove that you own it in the United States of America. If you have a nice car and you live in a bad neighborhood, you don't have to prove that it's your car. They have no right to pull you over and seize your property unless they have true probable cause. And what can you do about it? And you're saying, well, you're telling me all this stuff. What can I do? Well, if you have a good senator like Senator Loveless in Oklahoma, you can support them. If you don't have somebody who supports this in your area, any place in the United States of America, call them up. Say, hey, I think you guys should get behind this. If they don't have time for it, if it's not a priority, why isn't this a priority? What else are you guys spending your time on? You're my elected official. Make them work for you. You can find more reports on Infowars.com. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show on this Wednesday, July 30th, 2015. I'm David Knight, your host in Austin. 
Joining us now live from Spain is Alex Jones. He's there covering the collapse of Europe, looking at where the bankers will move next. And as Alex pointed out earlier in the show with his uh, report that he sent in, he's in Spain where they have recently enacted some very stringent rules against free speech, not just for domestic journalists, but also for people who are visiting there. So joining us now is Alex Jones in Spain. Alex? Thank you so much, uh, David, uh, here on this July 30th, 2015 global transmission. I do come to you live from Barcelona, Spain, and I look at the headline, Satanic Cult Used Profits from Baphomet Statute Unveiling to Fight Anti-Abortion Efforts. Why wouldn't they support child sacrifice? The New York-based devil obsessed cult known as the Satanic Temple used funds for recent PR-driven Baphomet statue unveiling in Detroit to fund an effort to undermine legal moves to ban abortion after 20 weeks, as well as other anti-abortion legislation. That story with video of the group, whether they're black or white or Hispanic, they all have green skin, all so white the skin's green. And anytime we go out and demonstrate and try to save babies, out of nowhere just uh, appears these, these ghouls, and you look at them, they have chicken necks, they're incredibly weak, they stumble over potholes, they can hardly walk, but everyone just bows down to them instead of war hammering them. I, I mean, they want to sit there and feed on innocence, let's let them have a real fight politically. They need to be war hammered. I mean, we don't serve a weak God, ladies and gentlemen, we serve the powerful God that created the universe. And the devil's taken over the churches and all these other systems, and that's why we are in the situation we are, bowing down to these piles of simpering, stinking, dead flesh that are self-propelled, walking around animated by their weak, fallen God. These people make me sick. And I didn't mean to get up here and start preaching. I apologize. It's just the, 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 the falling down and worshiping the green skin maggot vomit that is Satanist, makes me want to throw up. I mean, put me in a ring with them. I'll take five of them on at once. Give them battle axes. Give me one. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, I will send them all straight to hell. These people are weak, and I'm tired of them ruling over us. I'm tired of them. They want to throw up. <laughs> but the good news is, the good news is humanity is rising, and the globalists know it, and that's why they're working as hard as they can to try to shutter our minds, shutter our souls, and put us in their false reality so they can control us, because these evil people are afraid of those of us that are awake and tied into God and tied into the universe. And don't tell me that I'm a weirdo because I'm upset about this. I'm just sick of dishonorable trash. Supreme Cobra Command! Your failures! You think I'd sell my family out like you, dirtbag? <laughs> The burning weed with its roots in hell. Should marijuana be legalized? We'll debate the pros and cons right now. Marijuana leads to doing worse things. That's just a fact. I don't care what anybody says. The drug war is a total failure, and the federal drug war ought to be re revisited and for the most part gotten rid of. This has corrupted our government, it has destroyed our due process, and it is withholding from people medicine that is very effective, and we need to stop it. We need to roll prohibition back right now. Marijuana is natural. You know, there's so many different things that you can use it for, uh, including, you know, helping cancer patients. I'm a Christian minister, yeah, and I believe, you know, Jesus will be okay with it. There have been studies proven that children who have 400 seizures a day, that's intense. It's like, it's like a seizure a minute who can't stop just violently convulsing have been helped and have stopped having seizures up like after two to two, three days after applying the cannabinoid oil treatment to themselves, like in their food or something like that. Like that's incredible. There's proof of that. Like it's all over the internet. The mandatory minimums locking people up for nonviolent crimes for very long periods of time where there's no discretion for the fact that they were nonviolent, that this is their first offense. No, just lock them up. You two-bit heroes <laughs> making life miserable for innocent children. Why don't you go out and hunt real criminals? We got a tip on this drag race. But when we found the marijuana, well, sir, that's a very serious charge. Think about the tens of billions of dollars that Big Pharma makes a year with close to 20% of the population being on antidepressants when every major study shows that marijuana 
absolutely destroys depression in people, and Prozac can't even prove that it has any measurable positive effect, and they have to put on the insert that it may make you commit suicide. Things like alcohol kill people daily, um, and it's legal because it can be taxed. Happy to deliver alcohol. But weed is illegal, right? Hey, bud, <laughs> let's party. <laughs> I do think, that, however, that the pharmaceutical companies should stay away. Like, just keep it natural. Let's have the sun out, you know, like roast the seeds in the dirt. You know, like, just stay away, you know, let it be. You know, like, let it grow organically, and, like, that's, that's what will help people. It should definitely should not be legal because that's helping us make money on the streets. And prohibition. That's right. Peace. What's the obstacle? What what the hell is stopping it? What what? Why is Texas taking so long? Because we're in Texas, dude. Yeah. They haven't it's figured Texas. out how to make money off of it yet. They're, oh, they're, they're looking they're, at all the, the benefits there, from other states. They're so states. fucking right wing. They they're, they they don't care about the health benefits. They know that we're making so much money off the cancer and whatnot. They want us to be unhealthy. There's so many benefits for something that's natural. We need to look more into natural medicines and not things that are scientifically made in a lab. This is not reefer madness. This is one big industry that has political clout trying to shut down another industry that basically has uh, a, a product that grows freely and is not owned by anybody. I don't want the government regulating my marijuana. Okay, but right now they're regulating you. They'll arrest you if you smoke it. That's, That's regulation. True. But only if I get caught. Look at what the pharmaceutical companies are doing. They want to take away our informed consent and violate the Nuremberg Code, saying that they can inject us with whatever they deem to be necessary at any given time. We should be very, very concerned about this. I didn't know you were a weedhead, Tony. All my friends are. Alex Jones here reporting live from Barcelona, Spain. We're also going to be reporting from Madrid and other cities. We are investigating the press reports that basically all of Europe is falling into classical tyranny with capital controls, restrictions on the press, persecution of even mild political speech, stuff that used to be a huge deal when other countries did it. So what's happening to the West? Infowars.com is investigating. Now, I have to be very careful about what I say while I'm inside this country. We have not just discovered the fascism, the tyranny in the newspapers, in Zero Hedge in the United States, London Independent in the UK, uh, basically breaking down the fact that 1984 has come to Spain. We have already experienced it and can't even talk about it until we get out of the country. And I'm not going to be at this point giving folks details about when we'll specifically be leaving and going to the next EU country falling under um, totalitarianism in their words. Uh, that said, the headlines are everywhere uh, that people are being fined for criticizing police response times, no free speech. Um, they announced just a month ago um, 10 things you can't do. One of them is criticize the king in any way. Now again, this is supposedly a Western country. We hear criticisms uh, of organizations and groups uh, in China uh, or in Cuba. And we were all brought up that was just absolutely horrible and terrible. Uh, but now, not just here, but in the UK as well, uh, they're now nabbing people off the streets that try to go to draw Muhammad uh, cartoon events. So free speech is being eliminated. It's being expanded across the board. The United States is trying to bring this in as well. So I want to be clear, we're not picking uh, on Spain. This is a beautiful country. I've studied its history a lot. It's amazing. Uh, it has an ancestral memory of being invaded by the Moors out of North Africa and then having to be uh, reconquered uh, by uh, groups out of northern Spain and Europe. Uh, and they have been basically through a lot in the last uh, thousand plus years. So it's ingrained in the culture to get in line with totalitarianism. Uh, but before I get into the latest developments, it's important to note that uh, Franco, Francisco Franco, uh, who in the early 30s basically staged a coup to take over Spain, then groomed Juan Carlos, who wasn't even in line to the throne, to be his replacement upon his death in 1975. Anybody can look this up. 
it was only Spain that didn't get in trouble at the end of World War II. Italy, of course, got in deep trouble. My grandfather was part of the invasion of that country. Germany lost 20 plus million people uh, for the uh, activities of the Nazi party. Uh, Spain, that was uh, the first fascist nation to basically join Germany even before uh, El Duce, uh, Mussolini never got in trouble for it. Now, I want to be clear. The communists killed more people in Russia and in China than the fascists did. So it's, a, it's, it's not a question of lesser of two evils. I understand why a lot of Spanish people didn't want to go under the tyranny uh, of the Soviets. And they engaged in incredible uh, atrocities and, quite frankly, made the fascists look like good guys. So, so I'm not comparing Franco to Hitler because I've studied it. He wasn't. Uh, but he did call himself totalitarian. And then they put Juan Carlos in in 75. They supposedly had these faux reforms. They're now getting rid of those. And we have experienced it here. Uh, not any security at the airport other than guys walking up with machine guns and staring at us in the face and doing it to everybody else, families, you name it, and then saying welcome to the country, letting us right in. Then we went to just get a couple hundred euros exchange to pay for taxis. It's a lot of taxis only take cash. And it was just, you know, incredible. Well, where's your hotel? Well, give us this. Well, give us that. And they were putting in an Interpol database. Uh, let us see your passport. Uh where are you going? How long are you staying? And they were putting it in an Interpol database right in front of us. See, capital controls are coming here. They're coming to Greece. You have 40% unemployment in this country. With the collapse of society, we're going to see a move towards totalitarianism that is going to stifle the incredibly rich culture of Spain and other countries. The problem is the globalists have sold socialism and communism as the answer to fascism when it's something that's even a more virulent uh, variation historically uh, than even fascism. Uh, but it's like you're know, picking strychnine or cyanide. They'll both kill you dead in a hammer. So this is a rich people, a rich culture, really nice folks, very, very polite, uh, a lot of amazing, uh, you, know, you know, obviously art is everywhere. Uh, the architecture anywhere you look is simply amazing, whether it's medieval uh, or, or whether it's more modern. It's just that one thing is we're here uh, down at uh, one of the famous cathedrals, just videotaping it. And cops run over and get in our face and erase what's on our cameras uh, and apologize for it, but they were bugging their eyes out at us. And they said, oh, we have to do this because of Islamic extremism. And I understand this country got invaded and taken over by that. Then why is their government bringing it in at record levels? And then using it against people like us that came here with an open mind to try to basically investigate what's happening, what's unfolding. Um, again, there'll be a lot more that we're going to be reporting on in the next few days here, uh, but this is not a free country. And the veneer of freedom uh, is basically evaporating. It's basically uh, being disappeared for the people that live uh, in this once Christian nation. And as the Christian culture dies, which it's now doing, I mean, just 20 years ago, upwards of 90% of people went to church in Spain. And people say, oh, I'm sick of church. Well, the point is it was some culture. Now, something like 10% go. Same thing with England. And into that vacuum of globalist tyranny and the big banks looting people and the crony capitalism not letting the economy flourish, socialism is coming in and communism is coming in. And so they're putting a police state in place to counter that. So it's basically a choice of fascism or communism. And I just don't want either choice, but I'm not going to sit here and say that right-wing fascism uh, is worse than communism because historically it's just communism is the worst thing there is. But, but that's the false choice you're given. We need to transcend that and have a culture of art, have a culture of true liberty around the Bill of Rights and Constitution itself that comes out of Magna Carta, itself that comes out and helped create the Renaissance that, that Spain's been a big part of when it comes to art and literature and everything else. So I come to you from the country of For Whom the Bell Tolls, uh, of course, the Ernest Hemingway novel about the Spanish Civil War. He, he, he was here during the Spanish Civil War. He wrote a fiction novel about it. George Arwell uh, wrote a nonfiction book about his experiences here and was wounded fighting the fascist. And, and I totally get why he was fighting the fascist, but he even wrote in his essays, uh, you can buy them in big compendium books, that turn out the communist were just as bad or worse. And that's what 1984 is about, is if Stalin would have taken over England and Europe, what the world would be like. And now we've just got the globalists in charge who were just a high-tech version, uh, in the words of Aldous Huxley, uh, of a brave new world model. So again, we're, 
We're not trying to give you buzzwords here. We're not trying to demonize anybody here. It's going to be the Spanish police whose children end up losing their future as well. And they're allowing fascism to come in. It's going to be set up. It's going to fall to corporate communism where the corporations are offshore. They're above the law. They're exempt. Dipl diplomatic immunity. And there's communism on the ground. In fact, I predict if the new world order has its way and the EU super state's able to implode what's left of national sovereignty to bring in this tyranny, I predict uh, that, that these nations will all fall to a form of what I'm coining techno or technotronic or technocratic communism. And that's what we're facing because, again, it's communism on the ground, first socialism into communism on the ground to domesticate, to have controlled economies, with those controlled economies serviced by above the law mega corporations, less than 10 of them. There's about 100 right now, six media companies, five banks. But it's all consolidating right now. And all the ideologies, fascism, communism, all the fake choices we're given will mean nothing when this comes in. But, but remember, I'm in the only country that didn't fall at the end of World War II that was fascist. And they had a soft uh, you know, fascism after that, but it's back. And I can tell you, I've been in third world countries, I've been in Central America, uh, I've been in totalitarian regimes, and in England, they're also passing similar laws. There has been a conscious decision made uh, to do this. So keep an eye on us here. Uh, we hope to move to the next country and cover what's happening in Italy and in Greece and other areas. Uh, but they're moving to loot the Spanish uh, pension funds. They're moving to loot people's private bank accounts now with bail-ins. This is coming to the United States, and that's why I'm here, was to investigate firsthand exactly what's happening. Uh, but just a beautiful country. Always wanted to come here. I've read so many history books about it. Uh, and i got to tell you, I, it's even more amazing than uh, a lot of the stuff I saw in the central areas of London. Been there many times. We just picked a church courtyard here because it was a lot quieter from the city noise. This is not even a snapshot of uh, what's happening and unfolding. And uh, it is very, very sad for this country. All right, Alex Jones signing off for InfoWars.com. More taped reports, more live reports, uh, and more special reports coming. If you're watching this transmission, you are the hope of humanity. You are the resistance. The United States is sending heavy combat equipment into Eastern Europe. It is the Pentagon's most significant move in the region since the end of the Cold War. Russian President Vladimir Putin announced last week that Moscow would add 40 intercontinental ballistic missiles to its nuclear arsenal. We will stand up to Russia's actions and their attempts to reestablish a Soviet era sphere of influence. The U.S. will arm six countries, Romania, Estonia, Bulgaria, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, in order to prevent the type of assault that Russia launched in Ukraine. In response, we're taking a strong but balanced strategic approach. The United States and its NATO allies are getting dangerously close to a high-risk military confrontation with Russia over the current crisis in the Ukraine. A situation that can escalate at any moment and drive the world into a catastrophic and global conflict. And we are joined now by Paul Craig Roberts. I wanted to get your take on all this because a very dangerous situation going on right now in the Ukraine, a standoff between the U.S. and Russia. And to me, it, it looks like a, the beginning of a, a modern day Cuban Missile Crisis, if you will. What do you think? Uh, well, I think it's uh, worse than that. You know, the the Cuban Missile Crisis was easy to reconcile mm -hmm. because uh, you know the the, <clears throat> the Americans had recently stuck missiles in Turkey <laughs> on Russia's border, and so this was um, Khrushchev uh, responding to that with the intention of getting the missile bases out of Turkey, <laughs> which he, which he did. Yeah. Which he did. So I don't think that crisis was ever as dangerous as we were told, because I think that uh, both Khrushchev and Kennedy understood that uh, nuclear war, one way or the other, would destroy life on Earth, and they weren't interested in it. In those days, Washington did not have the hubris 
or the image of itself as the indispensable, exceptional country with the right to exercise hegemony over the world. Washington knew full well it didn't have any hegemony over Russia or Russia's allies. And so it kept things in balance. But you see, today, all that balance is gone. Well, today we have the neocons. And, and most people, when they That's think of neocons, they think of the Bush administration. But you and I both know that they're alive and well within the Obama administration right. as well. And I think the scariest part about the neocons, they actually believe that they could win a nuclear exchange with Russia. Am I right? That's exactly right. They do believe that. And that's why they had uh, United States uh, strategic doctrine changed, because in our strategic doctrine, nuclear weapons were a retaliatory force that you only used if you were under nuclear attack. But now the neocons have changed the doctrine, and nuclear weapons are a preemptive first strike force. Well, this tells Russia and China that the Americans might launch a preemptive attack on us. Yeah. Yeah, they, to destabilize the region. And I want to play a clip for you right now. And this goes back when the, the conflict first started in Kiev, when Obama addressed the American people. And he said that, that the U.S., they were just interested in what's best for the Ukrainian people, because <laughs> uh, after all, the Ukrainian people, they just want to be left alone. Let's check it out. The United States has been responding to events as they unfold in Ukraine. Now, throughout this crisis, we have been very clear about one fundamental principle. The Ukrainian people deserve the opportunity to determine their own future. Human beings have a universal right to determine their own future. It would represent a profound interference in matters that must be determined by the Ukrainian people. So, <laughs> I mean, it really is laughable, and it sounds to me like the beginnings of yet another uh, U.S. humanitarian effort out there in the Ukraine. So, I mean, give me a break. Obama has no interest, in, and he's not looking after the best interest of the Ukrainian people, right? Now, this is the guy who's just, whose government has just overthrown the elected Democratic government of Ukraine. Yeah, there you go. This is, he's just oh, so here's a brand new country with democracy. It's hardly taken root. And so what does he teach them? Oh, well, force can overthrow democracy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, uh, this, this is, uh, it's hilarious, but of course it's criminal. And that was a message to the American people. Of course, the people <laughs> in the Ukraine aren't buying it, but unfortunately, the people are so dumbed down and ignorant here in the United States that, that most of them are going to buy it, even, even on the, the right. Yeah, especially on the right. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> Americans are unaware that Ukraine has been part of Russia for longer than the United States has existed. <laughs> yeah. And Ukraine was separated out of Russia in the early 1990s when the Soviet collapsed left Russia powerless, and, the, and Washington was able to work its will. So they broke out Ukraine, they broke out Georgia, uh, and now they're committed to actually destroying the whole Russian Federation in order to prevent uh, the rise uh, of a country with sufficient resources and size and power to operate as a constraint against Washington's purposes in the world. So the whole thing, you see, is orchestrated by Washington as a way of trying to prevent Russia's rise. Uh, you know, Ukraine is now used for sanctions to break off uh, Russia's economic and political relationships with Europe in order to uh, keep Europe under America's thumb rather than lose them to Russian uh, lose them to dependency on Russian energy. So this whole thing is an operation against Russia. It's a propaganda operation. Now, the forces that <clears throat> Washington and NATO are putting on uh, Russia's borders, uh, uh, <laughs> these forces have no <clears throat> capability whatsoever of ta taking on the Russian army. Uh, well, of course not. And, and, and Putin's not <laughs> stupid. He knows what's going on. He knows the United States 
government, the CIA and the military industrial complex. They have a long history of overthrowing governments, uh, taking over countries by destabilizing the region, just like we've done recently in Libya, uh, Iraq, uh, right now in Syria, doing the same thing in the Ukraine. So he's not stupid. What's to stop Russia from a Pearl Harbor style uh, surprise sneak attack? I mean, do you think they're just going to lay down quietly and just let us run over them? What are they prepared to do? No, they're not going to be run over, but they're not going to do anything provocative. I think they realize that this is a propaganda campaign serving Washington, whose power is on the way. And that Washington is desperate <clears throat> to hold on to its empire, which is Europe and, and Japan, <laughs> Canada and Australia. <clears throat> and they're just going to let it go. And if it actually came to war, it would be the end of Europe. Yeah. There's no way Europe would survive. <laughs> if there's a war breaks out with Russia, Europe is a wasteland. No, I, I hear you. And before we go, one last question. Yeah, I know you, you worked with the, uh, or for the Reagan administration. You were very close to Ronald Reagan. It must be night and day to look at the Obama administration now compared to, to working with Reagan. What are some of the biggest differences? And did you ever think you'd live to see the day where so much corruption would run rampant in the White House? No. But it's not just Obama. It was George W. Bush. Oh, sure. And it was Clinton. You know, all this trouble started with Clinton's second term. He's the one who took NATO to Russia's borders in violation of the guarantees given by George Herbert Walker Bush and Secretary of State James Baker. So all the trouble started in Clinton's second term, and since then, we really haven't had a president. <laughs> and uh, the, the differences are, are massive. You know, when I was there, to have a government official stand up in public and lie through his teeth, <laughs> Even if the media hadn't called him on it, his colleagues would have. Sure. And But today, they all stand up and lie through the teeth. In fact, they never say anything is true. Dave, my mind is going. I can feel it. 